with Israel immediately, I understood that it was just like Ukraine. I'm like, this is going to be highly emotional. There's going to be a ton of misinformation. We have to do an incredible job about sifting through what is true and what is not. We will not let emotion cloud our actual news judgment. It's different from saying that you won't let your emotion get into your analysis. But whenever it comes to like what we are going to present as fact and not, you cannot let that bleed in. Unfortunately, a lot of people have been doing it. I've seen viral claims that eventually end up being misproven or misconstrued or stated a different case. And everyone is just willing to believe basically anything that they read. It's very, very important not to do that um, whenever we have fast moving things, because these things are your emotions are being played with for a reason. And by both sides, to be honest, you know, by the Palestinians and by the Israelis. So that, you know, for me, it's much more of just like, a, I'm in a state of caution. I'm just in a state of it's almost like uh, it's like a battle because you're like constantly being bombarded. Uh, you have people who are pulling you in all directions. They want you to represent this side. The pro-Israel side is like, oh, you got to represent the Israel side. The Palestinian side is like, no, you got to represent the Palestinian side. And then people are like, hey, you got to say this. and You got to say that. And you're like, oh, my gosh, like, I just feel like I'm getting totally bombarded. Luckily, I'm just, you know, in where I'm at where I'm at because I'm an extraordinary skeptic uh, and pretty much remain that way. Anytime I see America being pushed towards some sort of military conflict, you got to start asking questions. So that's where and kind of how it's been from the very beginning of just like, oh, God. And also, I really consider myself as someone who's like, I don't like to go in front of the microphone or in front of my camera with, without doing hours and hours and hours of research myself, running through with my team, uh, talking with everybody about it, even beforehand, formulating my thoughts best so that I'm not just coming blind. I want to be able to come in there very prepared. A lot of people are very busy and they take time. They give me the great privilege of their time and their attention to try and figure out what's going on. So you really owe it to those people in a moment like that. So that's like on a personal level. Uh, in terms of like where we're at right now, obviously it's hard, it's horrible what's happened. You know, the attack on Israel. Now we're in a situation where, look, I mean, I don't, I think my orientation is not uh, a secret here. I'm, you know, pretty, I have come to the position and I will give credit to the Trump wing for kind of opening my eyes to this type of ideology to really the school of like realism, neorealism, accepting um, an orientation where I have, have a policy where I try to stop the emotions at the door and just think about what's in it for us and what are we doing? Here is my fear right now. We are taping this. Uh, it's Thursday. It is October 12th. So we don't know yet what has happened. My fear based on the current situation is that Israel has already committed to a full-scale attack against Gaza. We don't know what that's going to look like. It could be occupation. It could be a counterinsurgency campaign. It could be um, a shoot -em up campaign. We'll see. We, we don't know what that is. But my fear on this is that the overwhelming bipartisan consensus and others has tricked us into forgetting that there could be a tremendous political response from the Middle East should we see a full-scale humanitarian disaster in Gaza. And... This is not a value judgment. This is what people need to understand. I'm not talking about whether you think it's justified or not. I'm talking about reality. The reality is, is a Gaza has 2.2 million people. It's one of the third most densely populated place on the earth. If we see mass death to the scale of 50 to 100,000 civilians die, I will just tell you this. The 2.2 billion Muslims who are on this planet will not take it lying down. To the scale of that, I don't know. The problem is, just as we just talked about black swan events in Ukraine, we could have similar black swan events in the Middle East. If you want to argue that that's worth it and that's fine, be my guest. But I, I want to stay as far away, the hell away from that as possible. I could easily see a scenario where Hezbollah uh, disregards its Iranian masters and just declares war on Israel. Now what? Now what are we doing? Israel's now in a two front war. It's not just going to be about weapons. They're going to immediately, there's already calls right now to bomb Hezbollah, to bomb Iran from, from multiple U.S. lawmakers. Um, now what are we going to do? We're going to, we, we will be in a situation where bombing Tehran is on the table. When bombing Tehran is on the table, we're talking about a full-scale Iraq level uh, war in the Middle East. We have tens of thousands of service members in Bahrain who could get wiped out overnight. Iran and Hezbollah are far more formidable opponents, both to Israel and to the United States, um, than Hamas ever. Hamas has got these piddly little rockets and AK-4. There's nothing compared to what we would be facing. At the same time that we just depleted all of our ammo stocks and sent them over to Ukraine, we have a tremendous amount of domestic political strife. We could get dragged into this very, very quickly. That's where all my attention is right now. 
I, I want to stay out of this. Do you think that some of the American neocons are being more hawkish than even the Israelis are right now? Uh, no, to be honest. Israel is actually totally united in what they have to do um, in Gaza. And actually, I get it. You know, if I was Israel, I'd probably feel the same way. Uh, they... I mean, I just saw like Naftali Bennett, who's supposed, what is he, like center right or whatever. Like mm -hmm. he was just on TV today being like, I don't care about Palestinian civilians. So, I mean, I think that the mainstream view amongst this Israeli civilian population is basically what the mainstream view of the American civilian population was post 9-11. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's not a value judgment. They can do whatever they want to do. I actually respect uh, it, them in many ways in terms of how they prioritize their own national defense. They look at their own security and they look at uh, protecting their people above anything else. Else. For example, not sending weapons to Ukraine when Zelensky has his hand yeah, up. Yeah, Max like, Boot was very angry about that. Right. A and they were like, no, ago. we might need them. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I wonder what he thinks about that now. Yeah. Except, you know, in his version, uh, I guess America can always just pay the bill. So, anyway, that's yeah, a, a separate thing. More what I'm saying is we are in a situation where the vast majority of American lawmakers correctly are mm -hmm. outraged by, by what happened in Israel. The issue is is that the vast majority of these American lawmakers are not thinking about 40th order effects. Now, I already know that the pro-Israel people will be like, this guy's a squish, and he's like saying that we shouldn't be able to do what needs to be done. I didn't say that. What I think needs to happen is that I think the US needs to tr tr exert a tremendous amount of pressure on the Egyptians and all the Gulf Arab states to foot the bill for a mass humanitarian evacuation of Gaza. We need to treat this just like we did the Battle of Fallujah. All the civilians have to go. Same with ISIS. This is what we did. Civilians, get out. All right. Now, listen, Hamas, they're the worst people on earth. They will trap some civilians with them. Um, but, you know, we need to give anybody who wants the opportunity or has the opportunity to leave Gaza. We need to get that done. We need to get them out of there. We could, you know, Egypt, whatever. Somebody can foot the bill. I think it should be Saudi Arabia and Qatar um, and not us. So. That needs to happen. Then, okay, go in, do whatever you want to do. Just commit that when you're done, you pull out and the people from Gaza can come back. That's it. We can allay some tensions about, oh, you're going to reoccupy the land just like 67 and all this other stuff. We can make sure, you know, as long as you try to reduce meaningfully the amount of civil civilian casualties and you don't give the Iranians, the Syrians, the Hezbollah, all the greatest talking point and uh, victory they could ever have. We, we, we will be okay and the Israelis will be okay. But here's what they should fear. Um, after we invaded Iraq, Iraq and Syria became the, uh, the beating heart of global jihad. They should be terrified of this possibility. If we get to a situation of mass civilian slaughter and all that, it could become a magnet for everyone across the entire Middle East and all the other, you know, the young guys who fought in ISIS, they, they're just going to start coming. Now what? Now, you know, it's a perpetuation. It's a cycle. Now we're starting to get attacked, you know, here because then it becomes an America ally issue. I realize this is unpopular, but, you know, you got to think about this. We all lived through Iraq and have 20 years of Afghanistan. We literally saw all of this all happen. So. My great priority is to keep America out of a war. Um, and unfortunately, though, I think we're far closer. Remember this. We're only not at war with Russia today because they have nuclear weapons. If if this was pre-nukes, we 100% be in a war with Russia. And Iran does not have, at least for now, does not have nuclear weapons. That that deterrence is not there. And that, that scares the hell out of me. Yeah, it it's unfortunate because I... I actually do hear from people in D.C. who are actually quite hawkish. who are saying, no, 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 we're not saying commit U.S. troops. But the mm -hmm. problem is that if we fall into a decision tree, that results in other Arab powers getting involved in yes. this war. The the logic will sort of militate that we do get involved. And so, well, they say not, the same thing on Ukraine. Yeah. No, no American troops on the ground. Yeah. yeah for now. Yeah. Now what? Poland. Yeah. What now? And and, yeah. the, and then there's also, I mean, always the question of, yeah, we might not be technically in the war, but is mm. it seen by the opposing power as that? And do they yeah. act accordingly? Um, these are all open questions that hopefully we would have serious people in D.C. to answer them. But um, we haven't thus far. What have you made of um, ha have there been any bright points in the media coverage around? So obviously, Breaking Points has been trying to be as honest and uh, truthful as it has. But wh where have you been? seeing the great examples of people in media doing well during this conflict well i don't know and there's smatterings there's like individual people and individual outlets that you can follow uh i try and get a you know a diet of 
everyone. My real recommendation would be don't trust outlets. Don't trust uh, do individual, look at their mm-hmm. track records over time. Look mm-hmm. at what they're saying. Do they issue corrections? Do they delete things? Mm-hmm. Are they doing their best? Are they falling for emotional coverage? Go back and check what the hoaxes are. Did the people fall mm-hmm. for the hoaxes? If they did, did they come back and did mm-hmm. they correct the record? If not, well, you know, you, that should be a telltale sign. Uh, but I think that, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not even going to point to individuals because, you know, everybody gets things right and wrong. It's about how they approach whenever they get the, uh, whenever it comes to the moment of correction, whenever it comes to the moment of continued coverage. I just, I would just urge everybody to be skeptical and to leave your, you know, you, you can be outraged and you can be heartbroken, um, but you also should just remember like what the inevitability of a lot of these conclusions and talking points are leading you towards.